you are listening to CPA Career Path Channel with Rosie Flaherty, CPA MSA. This is episode number 38. We continue the conversation with Matt Kidd to go further about his CPA journey. So when I first started that, started at the firm, it was honestly kind of back to that original client communication kind of block that I talked about, where it's almost like I reverted back to the taking an hour to spend a five minute email, um, which the, the fortunate thing is the way that we structured it, the, my partner that I was buying from, he was working a fair amount of hours when I first purchased it. And then it was declining each year. So I had in that first year or two, I did have a fair amount of excess time so that I could be be very intentional and careful about how I messaged with people and building that credibility. Because again, similar to when you're a staff, your credibility is starting at zero with the clients. So you need to be very careful about building that credibility giving the correct answers. And if you don't know the answer, not being afraid to say that. Just say, I don't know, but I know where to find the answer. Because most people don't expect you to know everything on the spot. And if they truly do expect you to know every single thing, odds are it's not a person you want to work with. (laughs) So how old were you at the time you purchased that CPA firm? So I was 26 years old. That's very young. Yep, and I had no gray hair at that point, which I don't know. I just got a haircut, so it's not as obvious right now. But I think I've added a few since then. (laughs) (laughs) So at that age of 26, that you just had a few years experience under your belt in, in public accounting. And then now you start like your own practice. At that time, you mentioned that you were very nervous, and then you try to build, I would say, your image with not just only your customers or your clients, but also with your employees or your staff as well at a very young age. I was wondering at that time, would your dad or your brothers try to help you to build up your firm at that moment? Yes, I had a ton of, ton of support from my family. Um, Cause I had, my brother had actually purchased a firm, I think two years before me, um, with, he did a more of a short-term transition with the person that he purchased from. And he was in a a little bit of a different spot because he was working at that firm. So he didn't just come in when he bought it, but he was working there. Um, and that, when that opportunity came along. So he had a lot of guidance and experience in how that went. Um, And the same with my dad. Um, Throughout his career, they, I think he purchased four or five different firms as part of the firm that he was with. So he'd been through that experience before. But the biggest thing is every, every purchase is different. Um, So no, no two firms are the same. There's usually with sole practitioners, you're dealing with personalities because usually you build the firm tailored to your personality and you, I think, generally tend to attract clients that align with your personality. So if you're considering going down the route of, you know, purchasing a firm, I think it is very important that you take the personality factors into consideration. Because Wait. you're most likely going to be working with clients who enjoy working with the current owner's personality. Oh, so you're saying that as long as your personality align with the previous owner personality, that should be good for the purchase. Mm-hmm. And it's certainly, I mean, not a deal breaker, but that is generally they've dealt with, they've been dealing with that person. <laughs> for 10, 20, 30 years. Um, So to make that transition as smooth as possible, you try and try and offer that same, same service really is what it is, is the service that's being provided. 
And then as you build the credibility, you can make you can make changes and kind of shift to your own own style and your own methods. Uh, so after five years having your own CPA firm now, what what is the best lesson that you have got throughout the town? Nothing is as good or as bad as it seems. <laughs> Why do you say that? <laughs> there there are going to be things that seem like they're absolutely world ending. And then with the value of hindsight, you realize they weren't a big deal. Um, you're going to build up fears in your mind that are truly nothing more than fears in your mind. But you'll be thinking about them. And then kind of the the nothing is as, is as good as it seems. You're going to get some early wins that feel like you absolutely knocked it out of the park. And for that moment, it absolutely is. But again, with the value of hindsight, I think for most people, that's just a stepping stone to what the next big win is going to be. That a lot of time when things happen, you will feel like, oh my gosh, you want to lose a job tomorrow just because what happened today. Like, and then you still have the job a year later. <laughs> <laughs> that makes perfect sense. So how, how many people are your firms now after five years? Yep. So now we've got three, three full-timers, two part-time, and then two more seasonal. So really, we've gone from two to what would that be like five five FTEs really. So from beginning, when you purchase the CPA firm, what's the revenue at that time? And five years later, what the revenues at this time? <laughs> yeah. So when I purchased the firm, it was about four hundred thousand dollars of revenue. Um, now we're on pace in 2023, probably going to be somewhere between 700 and 750,000 in revenue. What's your working schedule like at this time? Five years, I would expect five years now, you should be able to get everything in the schedule that you want. Is that right? Uh, yes, yes and no. I'd say yes with a caveat. Um, I, I shouldn't say I get bored easily. But when things are running smooth, I'm always looking for the next thing to do. So I'd say we got got things running incredibly smooth. Um, probably took really, I mean, COVID, COVID was a killer for everybody. I mean, especially with working with the small businesses. We had doing so much work around the ERC and PPPs that it, it absolutely crushed us from a, a time standpoint. But Coming out of COVID in 22, I think I worked about maybe 1,600 hours I actually worked. Um, so pretty darn low in terms of the, the quality of life, um, which I love. And it, that looked like about six, we were working about 60 hours a week in tax season. Um, May through October, our entire office is closed on Fridays. So we're cl we're now working four days for six months out of the year. Um, in the summertime, I usually try to at least three days a week. I water ski in the morning, roll into the office about ten thirty after a water ski, and if it's a sunny day, I might work till three or four o'clock, and then I'll go home and head back out on the lake. Um, That's but, a very nice lifestyle. <laughs> It is. That's why, and like honestly, that's that's a huge part of why I chose to go into the route that I did. Is in Michigan we have absolutely gorgeous summers. I mean, it's what it's what keeps people here, and I always wanted to build a firm around being able to enjoy that. So I've been very intentional about not taking on work that overloads the summer, both for me and the the rest of the team. I mean, we we want to be able to enjoy our our beautiful weather. You mentioned about 1,600 hours. Is that just for beable hours or is including both beable and non-beable hours? 
So that is billable and non-billable in the firm, I would say. Um, and this is a rough estimation because I don't really track my time that well. Um, I mean, I think if you look at my if you look at my time report, I think I worked like 84 hours last year. Um, <laughs> so it's a rough rough estimation. <laughs> yeah, I would say that is that is what I would consider the what has to be done for the firm. And then I would say I probably spend about 200 hours a year, what I would call kind of learning or self-improvement or firm improvement that aren't things that need to be done, but things that I honestly just kind of in, enjoy doing, like looking at new software options, you know, reading books that are geared towards firm management or business. I don't view that as work. Um, I'm sure some people do. For me, it's not. I mean, I truly enjoy it. And then the other thing I do spend a lot of time on is volunteering. So with the uh, Michigan Association of CPAs and AICPA, um, between them, I'm, I'm heavily involved. So I probably spend roughly 200 hours a year doing volunteer work with the uh, MICPA and AICPA. And uh, additionally, I help sign up and I'm the treasurer for an uh, organization called the Get To Foundation, which was set up in, in honor of a friend, a friend of ours that was killed by a drunk driver, but he coached high school football. And his mentality was always get to. I mean, you, you don't have to do anything. You get to do it. So you don't have to go to work tomorrow. You don't have to go work out. You get to do it. And we do that by, uh, we fund, we basically, we help remove barriers to youth sports. So for kids that maybe they, they can't afford cleats to play football, they're playing football in tennis shoes, will help buy cleats. Um, there was a youth baseball organization that it was completely free for any inner city kids. They had run out of fields. So we did a grant to help build a new field to allow more kids into it. Um, so that is another, another volunteer piece that again is, it's an opportunity as a CPA, because when it comes to volunteer organizations, people are always looking for a CPA to be on the board for that business experience. So it gives you an amazing opportunity to get involved into whatever organization is that you enjoy because they're after that expertise. So when did you start volunteering with the State Society and with AICPA? So I started volunteering with the State Society in, it was, I, it was at my second firm. So my guess is I was probably 23, 24, probably about 24 years old when I started and just started by going to the their emerging leaders functions. So they did did happy hours. And I just started started showing up to the happy hours because I mean as as you know, Rosie, you, you, you have to twist my arm to get me to go to a happy hour with people. <laughs> <laughs> I know I know I have to tell a lot of staff to go to happy hours. The the thing I say that you go to happy hours is is free food there. You have a chance to meet people and then you never know. Maybe you want to go to the second event again, but it's just good to just go and have fun with other people. You don't have to worry about work. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, those events have built some great relationships that have turned into friendships over that time period. I, you know, I met, met at a work event. It was a professional setting, but they become friends over time. Yeah, so friendship is one of the benefits from attending or volunteering for the state society. What other benefits that you have gained from volunteering at the state society and also at AIC, AICPA? Yeah, I mean, I think the biggest thing you mentioned is the the connections and the relationships that you build. Um, personally, for our firm, the majority of our referrals come from other CPAs. So 
we're we're not out going to chamber of commerce events or other types of business organization events. We're pretty much relying on the CPAs that we know to refer us work from things that they don't personally do in their firms. Um, and that's been a, a fantastic kind of business model for us because you're generally getting high quality clients when you're getting them referred from other CPAs. But beyond the kind of, I'll call that the, the tangible benefits, the intangible benefits is you, I won't even say intangible benefits. You don't know where the path is going to take you. Um, so when I started going to happy hours, I really had no, no plan or aspirations of what I wanted to do with the state society or intentions to volunteer. It was just the chance to meet people when I was in a small firm. Um, and kind of as that, that path has evolved, they kept asking me to do different things. And I kept saying, yes, I would say the first, first one was they called an asked phone to be the chair of the emerging leaders task force. Um, still, still tell the, uh, the liaison who asked me about that, that the only reason she got a yes is she caught me in, uh, on vacation after about five margaritas. So that was, that was how I first said yes to volunteering. And then once, once they got you on the line and you've said yes, once they keep coming back. So like, from there, I joined the, the PAC board. Um, after the PAC, I'm still on the PAC board. Forget what else I'm, uh, small practitioners. So we have a small firm task force that puts on a conference every year that I help organize and speak at. And then after doing that for a few years, actually, they asked me to join the board after probably three or four years. I was volunteering with other things. Um, and at the time, I think still, but by far the youngest person on the board by probably 20 years. But it happened because I kept showing up and kept saying yes. It wasn't my plan. It wasn't my desire. But you kept showing up, kept saying yes, and you you will continue to receive opportunities. And those opportunities will bring you, as you said, the jobs offers, yes. the jobs reference, as well as the relationship, friendships for long term. <laughs> like we're talking about saying yes. Remember the AIC Bay Leadership Academy, we're talking so much about setting boundaries. How can you set boundaries when you keep saying yes to all the opportunities? Uh, so I think I, I've got a little bit of a, a mixed opinion on this. Um, I'm still a strong believer in early in your career saying yes to everything that you can reasonably do. Now, Obviously, if you're if you're sacrificing sleep, and if you've got a, a family that you're not able to see your family because of the things that you're saying yes to, that's a problem. But if you're if you're single, if you're young married, say yes to all the opportunities that you can, because your life will never be less busy than it is in the current moment. That goes from the time you're a little kid. You might think you're busy when you start junior high sports. You're not busy compared to when you're doing high school sports. In high school, you're not busy compared to what you're doing in college. And in college, you're not busy compared to what you're doing in work. And the thing is, it just keeps getting busier and busier. So the younger you chance you have to jump into those opportunities, I firmly believe you absolutely should. Um, and it may tire you out, but at that stage, often your alternative is you're spending less time at the bar instead of volunteering with those opportunities. So it's probably a good thing. <laughs> um, and then the challenge does become, and I, I wrestle with it, um, once you, at a certain point, you do need to start turning it down and turning things turning down opportunities, um, which has really just been for me in the last few years, 
I've had to start start saying no to some things, had to stop doing some things. And that's hard to decide. But it is a far better position to be in to need to say no to things as opposed to not being asked to do things. And to get to that point, you have to say yes to a lot of things early in your career. That's a very interesting point. A lot of us may not consider saying yes to volunteering opportunities, something that could be beneficial for their career for long term. That's really great that you show the overall picture of volunteering, how it can help staff, especially young staff. That could be super, super helpful for their career for long term. The last two people that I've hired, there we didn't have job postings. They were just people that I knew, that I talked to, and they ended up coming to work for us. So I think that is the, and that's from saying yes. I mean, it's people I, I met all because they chose to go out and do something that they were asked to do. So it means when you volunteer, you may find a job. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yep. The, the employers can tune out to this portion of it. <laughs> but no, I mean, honestly, I think that the employers that encourage you to go out and do those types of things, they're the type of employers you don't want to leave. So that's, yeah, that's my take on it. Yeah. And besides of talking about young staff, or like when you are early at your career, you should volunteer. Are there any other things that you think young staff should do at the early age of the career to benefit their career for long term? I mean, I think again, yeah, it goes back to to saying yes and saying yes to a variety of opportunities. Um, particularly around any chance that you have to meet new people. So any type of networking event and also speaking. Um, the easiest way to speak when you're fresh out of college is to go back and speak to other students. And that's a fantastic way to refine your public speaking ability. Because odds are when you go back, you're going to be nervous. I mean, that's how I started it. Is I, I went back and I would speak to high school and college students. And like I... I'd get nervous and you could hear the, you know, the, the shake, shake in the voice as I was uh, starting it out. You know, I didn't spill any coffee on, unfortunately, but it was, it was still nervous for me. Um, so that is the, and then going to networking events, just cause you learn, you learn how to speak to people. You learn how to present yourself that you can only do, you can only learn by doing it. Um, so don't be afraid of something that seems like a, if you say, oh, well, I, I shouldn't go to this because it doesn't apply to apply to my job. The odds of you doing the same type of job 20 years down the line aren't great when you look at things, look at it from a statistical perspective. Odds are you're going to be doing something different and you never know where you're going to be, where that next opportunity might come. I think I somebody I heard it on a podcast. I don't know who to give it credit to, so somebody can chime in and steal it if they want. But it was about the best thing you can do is increase your chances of luck. And what they mean by that is put yourself in as many positions as possible that you might get lucky. Because you're not going to most of the time. But every once in a while, I mean, luck is going to be you meet a you meet somebody that turns out to be a lifelong friend. You meet somebody that turns into a job opportunity. You meet somebody that turns into a mentor. And you're never going to get that without luck. So the best thing you can do is increase your chances of luck. That's a very good saying. I love it. Yeah. Because somebody was brilliant that came up with it. I just stole it and I don't know who to give credit to. <laughs> <laughs> because a lot of a lot of successful people, they always say that they get to where they are right now because they get some luck in their life. But increasing the chance 
of having luck, that's a really good way to increase the chance of having su- a lot of successful tries in your career. That's amazing. Um, Besides talking the actions, what they should do, what characteristics that you think young CPAs or young accountants they should develop in the earlier stage of their career? So you're you're going to have challenges no matter what career path you go through, um, whether it be public, whether it be industry, whether you choose to leave the CPA profession altogether there's going to be challenges that are going to be difficult to get through. And the best thing you can do early in your career is develop that grit that will help you to make it through those challenges. Um, Because those who are willing to work through those challenges are going to be the ones that end up in the rewarding spots. And I'm not just talking about being a, a partner in a big firm making millions of dollars a year it's going to be the the ones who choose to become a professor in order to get their phd you're going to have to go through obstacles and challenges that no one in public county is ever going to have to go through if you want to raise a family and continue working full-time or part-time you're going to go through challenges that the person working in industry or even their phd isn't going to go through So no matter what you choose, there's going to be challenges and having the grit to get through them and turn them into opportunities is the best thing that you can do. You mentioned about challenge. We're talking a lot about the challenge in these accounting professions that not many people join these accounting professions. Do you have any ideas how we can deal with this challenge? So I've got I've got some ideas. I don't know if any of them are good, but um, <laughs> no, I think the biggest thing is getting people to understand what our profession really is, which is the biggest obstacle and should be the best opportunity. I mean, kids aren't hearing that when when they think tax tax CPA, which is basically what I, what I do. I'm doing tax and accounting for service-based businesses. They hear the 70-hour work weeks in tax season, and that completely checks them out. They're not hearing the 25-hour weeks in the summertime that you're out on the boat five days a week, hanging out with your family, plenty of time to do whatever you want. And I think that is, we need to flip the script and present all of the positives in this profession as opposed to leaning with the negatives. It's very difficult to talk about the hours because we have busy season for tax and audit. It's just like the bottleneck that at that time, it's just really, really busy. And you can avoid working that many hours during that specific time from February to April. That's for tax or for audit. It depends on the year end because you need to finish within 30 to 60 days after the year end. So by showing the hours for the people who may want to be in these accounting professions, it's very challenging to tell them that, oh, don't worry, you may not have to work that many hours. How can you make that idea to be in action, to be really something that we can do it to show people that the hours in public is not that scary. Yeah, I think the biggest thing is getting getting out and talking to students. You know, we got we got to hit students at the high school level because um, often by the time they hit college, they've already decided against it. Um, so we need, need to hit students in high school. But I guess circling back to your question, were you asking how we how we get firms to move to that? as opposed to kind of the the year-round busyness that some experience right now? Let me rephrase. How we represent to students, either in college or high school, about the hours, when particularly a lot of firms still work in that many hours? (laughs) So, I mean, that is a... We've got to look ourselves in the mirror as a profession. (laughs) And uh, I think we've made a lot of progress. But we still have a long ways to go. Um, I think you're seeing, particularly in the small firms, 
I, I don't want to call it a revolution, but a rather I'd say it's an evolution that you're having a large influx of new young CPA owners who are refusing to accept the old way of doing things. They're refusing to accept that 80 hours is acceptable to work in a week. They're refusing to accept that you should pick up additional, say, audit work just to keep people from twiddling their thumbs in the summertime. And really, that is what's going to drive the change in my mind. Um, the bigger challenge is the, the larger the organization, the more difficult it is to change. I mean, you have so many ingrained processes, so many ingrained issues that it's just more difficult to change a large organization. So I think the biggest driver within the profession is going to be those new firms that are driving change amongst the, and when I say small firm, really I'm talking everybody with less than 50 employees in their firm. So really some quite large firms that I think those legacy large local firms, I'll call them with 50 people, are the most at risk of becoming irrelevant um, because they face some of the constraints of not evolving with the times. Like it's often a, a tough management structure to get everybody on board since it is a partnership model that if they aren't proactive in evolving how they work, you're going to have new firms that effectively take them over. And I think if they're not willing to change how they're working, those new firms will take them over. And that's what's going to drive the, really drive the change within the profession of making firms a more reasonable lifestyle than what we've seen. So the best way to represent it, it is to change ourselves, change the <laughs> firms. So, and then we can represent the fact to students. That makes sense. Yeah. And talking about another challenge, you see, you are, we hear a lot about AI, a lot about chat GBT coming in in our professions. A lot of people who not really understand about this accounting profession just worried that AI can replace human being and replace CPAs in these accounting professions. What's your thought about that? All of the talk of it replacing CPAs, replacing attorneys, replacing financial advisors. A huge aspect of what we do, and that was compared, say we're, we're unlicensed therapists to a certain degree to our clients. We're talking through their issues. We're a sounding board, particularly for being a business owner is often a lonely place because you can't, you can't talk about it with most people. You may not want to talk about it with your competitors. You can't talk about it with your employees, your wife. She's friggin' sick of listening to it every night. So you don't want to talk about it with her all the time. So that is where the, the advisors come into play. And I think with the rise of AI, I think it's going to be a very positive thing in forcing us to be more empathetic and more understanding of our clients to help them work through those decisions. Because AI, at the end of the day, can't make a decision for you. It can provide you the information but most people don't make decisions based off of what is the obvious factual choice. They make decisions based off of their life experiences, based off of their circumstances, based on where they're at in life. And so recently read a book called the, the psychology of money that they, they dive in, dive into this, that it is, most often people make the decision that helps them sleep at night. And that's not always what is the fact-based answer. 
So our job is going to be safe as long as humans have emotions. And if we get to the point that humans don't have emotions, then I don't, I don't know. I assume that alien that the government has captive got out or something and took us all. That's, that's all I can think of. Oh my gosh. When, when humans are going to stop having emotions? Huh. <laughs> it will be never. Yes, unless aliens agree with you about that. <laughs> so talking, so that is one of the biggest challenge that a lot of people misunderstand about AI or technology in these accounting professions. So you are not the first person I have spoken with that that, that they are very excited about technology coming in to help them to do low level, low skill tasks so they can focus on the higher skill tasks or advanced tasks. So that will be something that hopefully over time people can think differently about technologies, about automation and AI in the accounting profession specifically. I feel like we've touched a lot of things about your CPA journey, about accounting career. But before we end this interview, do you have any last tips and advice for any young or accounting CPAs out there? Just get involved. <laughs> and if you're, in, if you're in high school, get involved in the business club. If you're in college, join the, the accounting honors or the accounting club. I mean, that's how I, I originally got started with the, the accounting club in college. Um, that was kind of my first first place that I volunteered in, and it it built connections even at the college level that I'm still still friends with today. Um, so just get involved. Awesome! Thank you so much, Matt, for the interview today. Thank you so much for all the all your advice and your tips during the interview as well. Yep. Yeah. Thanks for thanks for having me. I think it's about four. Or 15 Michigan time. So it's about time I uh, go out to the beer fridge, grab a Miller Lite, and head out on the boat. Oh, my gosh. I'm so <laughs> jealous with your lifestyle. That's so amazing. 